Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today in our tortoise talk. My name is Alex Oconius and I work here at the Living Desert and I will be your host today. And I'm joined here by four panelists and my co-host Natalie Gonzalez and, and they will all be introducing themselves to you in just a few minutes here. Um, first, I just want to remind you that we are all here to celebrate Desert Tortoise Week. And to do that, today we have gathered this panel of local tortoise, desert tortoise uh, experts who are here to talk to you all about tortoises, about general tortoise facts and information, um, about conservation successes and, and stories, and then of course how uh, we all as community members can get involved in uh, tortoise protection efforts as well. So we have representatives from the Living Desert, from the Bureau of Land Management, um, and from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, who is the main host of Desert Tortoise Week. And so we do have some questions prepared for our panelists, but we'll also be gladly accepting questions from our audience as well. So please, uh, throughout the event, we welcome you to submit those questions through the Q&A. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A button. You can click that, type your question in there, enter it. it. Might take us a minute or two, but we will try to respond to your question. We may also have some viewers uh, tuning in with us from Facebook Live, and you're also totally able to submit your questions to Facebook as well, and we will try to um, answer those as well. There's a bit of a delay with Facebook, but we'll get to them as soon as possible. Uh, so I want to introduce first our uh, co-host, Natalie Gonzalez. So she will be working mainly behind the scenes and she'll help field your questions and, and get them to me and then get them to our panelists. So you wanna give us a wave, Natalie. And then for the other panelists, um, they are actually going to introduce themselves to you and tell you a bit about um, their work with tortoise conservation and the institution that they work with. Um, so let's go ahead. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Dr. James Danoff Berg. I'm the Director of Conservation Engagement and Learning at the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens here in Palm Desert, California, in the Coachella Valley. Uh, and our focus as an institution is very much on community based conservation. So much of what we do is focused on working with communities to address the root causes of problems. And so with respect to the desert tortoise, a lot of what we do is focused on outreach and behavior change and engagement of the community with this fantastic animal. And we work with these wonderful people who will be speaking uh, and introducing themselves just a moment. Pass it on. Hi, I'm uh, <clears throat> Vincent James. I work for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in the Palm Springs office. I'm a wildlife biologist and welcome everybody. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Uh, primarily my responsibilities are uh, desert tourist recovery efforts and ensuring conservation for the species. I also work with a number of our conservation partners and as well as federal and state agencies to implement rules and regulations underneath the Endangered Species Act. Hi, my name is Scott Hoffman. I'm also at the Palm Springs uh, Fish and Wildlife Service office uh, alongside Vince. And um, we do similar work, but, but also pretty different work. We, live, uh, we work in different parts of the desert uh, where desert tortoises um, exist. Um, I also get to do a lot of work with other species, which is fun and keeps things diverse. Um, with, at, with tortoises specifically, I, I do a lot of work with the Department of Defense and other federal agencies such as the Bureau of Land Management. And um, prior to my career with the service, I was actually a, a field biologist, uh, consultant, and, and did uh, spent a lot of years working with desert tortoises in the field. And I've brought that um, kind of background with me to the service. And um, I've gotten to uh, instruct different types of workshops, handling workshops, health disease workshops. And that's, that's always a lot of fun to get involved with. Thanks. Thanks for being here. And then last, but certainly not least, Kayla. Hi, I'm Kayla Brown. I'm a wildlife biologist with the Bureau of Land Management out of the Palm Springs South Coast Field Office. And I work with all different species of wildlife. Um, so, um, you know, 
Um, my focus with Desert Tortoise has been working a lot with our different partners and BLMs and multi-use agencies. So we work with uh, different applicants on their projects and then we've got OHV projects that we do also. So it's you know, a lot of partnerships with the state and other federal agencies for Desert Tortoise efforts and for wildlife in general. Great. Thank you all. So um, I think it's to be clear we have years of experience and even just this small group here and also um, people and organizations coming at desert tortoise conservation from many different angles. So it'll be really interesting to hear how all those pieces uh, fit together and complement each other. Uh, the first question that we have is for you, Vince, but to the other panelists, you should, of course, feel welcome to chime in as well. So Vince, the desert tortoise must be a pretty special and iconic species for us to dedicate a whole week to celebrating it. And as the lead coordinator for Desert Tortoise Week, could you tell us, in your opinion, why are we recognizing the desert tortoise with this whole week of events? Or, or what about it has really caught or, or deserves our attention? Well, Alex, um, thank you for asking that. You know, as a Fish and Wildlife Service biologist and working for the service, our mission is to work with others to pr protect, conserve, and enhance fish and wildlife and plants and their habitats for the benefit of the American people. And this event, these series of events, is part of our outreach to educate and promote awareness of this iconic desert species. It's quite charismatic. If you're hiking out in the desert and you run across one, I mean, who doesn't want to take a great photo with it? Of course, keep your distance, but it's a great, uh, great animal to find in the wild. Uh, last year, we did a kind of a trial run to see just how many people would be interested in this kind of, these types of events. And we were able to reach a little over 800,000 uh, social media accounts sharing facts and videos about desert tortoise and then we also last year we actually had in-person events where you could pull weeds you could go hiking you could have talks in person and we had over 800 participants for all of those events and so just from that little trial run that we did right here in the coachella valley in california you know i recognize this awareness that folks actually are interested in, in learning more about the species so this year, we decided to try to expand it to cover the entire range of the species, which includes all the way up to Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and in Southern California, both Mojave and the Colorado Deserts region. So that's kind of one of the, the highlights for this week is just to kind of promote the awareness of this species and to encourage the public to learn more. And I find that, you know, people, we protect what we know and what we love and, Hopefully from these series of events and from the facts that you see on social media, you can learn more about the species and participate in the conservation efforts that we are all trying to do for this very charismatic species. Definitely agreed and thank you for that response. Um, I will also open the floor if anyone else would like to add from their own experience or, or love of the desert tortoise. Please, please go ahead. So I wanted to give a, a kudos and a shout out to Vince for starting this week because these kinds of, of events that are focused on in a specific organism, a specific event, really draw a lot of attention. And, you know, this was entirely Vince's idea. Started it last year. We helped him with creating a lot of things in the Coachella Valley, and we had one, many wonderful collaborators on that with him. Um, but uh, this expansion across the whole range is a great thing because tortoises are declining across much, if not most, of the range of uh, the Southwest. So let's get some people passionate about this awesome organism. So that's off. Indeed. Okay, so I'm gonna go to our next question for now. Um, this is for all of you. Um, maybe Kayla or Scott, you might wanna start off with this one. Uh, so each of you is working to encourage tortoise protection or conservation in some capacity or another, and that may be from an ecological research side of things, um, could be working with policy change or um, 
but we do a lot of the living desert, a lot of public outreach and education, just to name a few of the many approaches that, that we take in desert tortoise conservation. So could you each take kind of a few minutes to explain the approach through which you support tortoise conservation, as well as why this piece is so important to the, the puzzle of desert tortoise conservation? So Scott or Kayla, do you want to take a first stab at this one? I know that's a big question. You work on so many things. So how do you uh, narrow it down for us? Um, you know, one of the main focuses that um, I think is important is um, habitat restoration. So, you know, as multi-use BLM, we have OHV activity that can create incursions in habitat. And so we can apply to off-highway vehicle grants to then restore those incursions and help um, restore that, you know, habitat for desert tortoise. So we've partnered with um, the Farmers Institute for Education, Leadership and Development, FIELD for short, and they were awarded an OHV restoration grant in the Big Morongo Canyon area of critical environmental concern. So starting last year, they, they were going out and, you know, vertical mulching and broadcast seeding and putting up small boulders um, around uh, OHV incursions off the designated OHV route. So that's, you know, it's really been positive to see the, those habitat improvements. Um, and we've also partnered with you, the Living Desert. You've outgrown plants for us, um, and we're planning to pick up those plants and start putting them in that habitat that we've began to restore. So we're really excited for that. Um, and, you know, um, just applying for future OHV grants and seeing where we can continue to implement habitat improvements. I think that's, you know, a positive way to help increase the population um, or at least help stabilize the decline of desert tortoise so we can get in those native plants, help prevent, you know, the spread of invasive species um, and help spread awareness with our OHV users also. So part of the grants we can do is like ground ops grants is um, we can put up route signage or update our kiosks and brochures for users and we like to include information about desert tortoise on those so we can see like hey look under your vehicle for desert tortoise when you're out in the desert or you know ways to when you're looking at um, if you find a desert tortoise how to you know keep your distance but enjoy seeing it um, so things like that. Yeah, definitely. I would think that that habitat restoration part is especially key as we continue to lose more habitat, that, that the habitat that remains is in really good condition, like you said, with all those those native plants. So that's, that's great. Um, Scott, what about yourself? Sure, thanks. So besides the two words, desert and tortoise, I think the word that y'all are going to hear maybe most often today would be, and Kayla mentioned it a few times, is partnerships. Um, so I'll describe just really briefly the kind of work that I do with my agency and, and how that really just completely relies on building partnerships and maintaining those for, for conservation of desert tortoise as well as a lot of other species. Um, so at the Fish and Wildlife Service, we, we do a lot of regulatory work and um, this you know, this would be permitting projects, working with other federal agencies, working with project applicants to help them design projects and implement projects in a way that has the most minimal effects on a landscape or on a species. And, you know, when we, when we authorize projects, um, you know, in return, you know, we're, we're looking to get conservation value out of a lot of this work. And, and so building these partnerships with you know, project applicants and agencies in the state, you know, California Department of Fish and Wildlife and, you know, I could go on and on and on, but um, building and maintaining these partnerships is, is really critical to the work that we do. Um, <clears throat> and a lot of good conservation value comes out of that. Um, besides, you know, the regulatory side of things, which is, you know, projects, and like I mentioned, I do a lot of work with the Department of Defense. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about recovery actions. And the recovery of the desert tortoise. That's the that's the ultimate goal. When we list when we list the species under the Endangered Species Act, the goal is then to work to conserve that species um, until it no longer needs the protections of the act. And so that's what we term recovery. Um, so again, with recovery, you know, we work with a multitude of partners to implement projects. Uh, many 
you know, similar to the ones Kayla described, habitat restoration, um, closing, you know, illegal OHV routes, um, working for invasive, you know, plant species management, things like that. Um, but we have a, you know, a whole prioritized list of recovery actions for the desert tortoise. And, um, you know, that, that really provides us the framework for, for, the, for the conservation work that we do. Um, some other things that we do as an agency, uh, public outreach is also a very critical component to con uh, conservation. Uh, we work with a lot of really cool organizations like the Living Desert who's hosting this outreach event. <clears throat> um, um, you know, just, just educating people about things like, you know, raven predation of, you know, uh, t desert tortoise hatchlings and, you know, uh, the, the consequences of invasive plants and what that means to a desert tortoise. Um, you know, those are really, these are really important things that, you know, we need to help educate people on so that they understand, you know, better the, you know, just the general environment that they live in um, and then can make a connection with it, I think. Um, you know, some other outreach events that I've participated in, you know, there's, you know, day classes at, uh, at schools such as Copper Mountain College, you know, they do a desert tortoise conservation uh, course every, uh, normally every spring, they had to cancel this year, but you know, it's a day where, where, you know, members of the general public, um, you know, visitors to Joshua Tree, um, you know, you know, people who work for agencies, they all come together and just spend the day really, you know, learning all about desert tortoise conservation and life history and desert tortoise characteristics. Um, you know, we, we host workshops for field biologists. We, um, you know, do a number of different events throughout the year. Um, one thing I guess I know something that I kind of do, it's not really part of my work, but on the side is the rehabilitation of injured uh, wild tortoises. Um, you know, one of, one of, I think, the big threats to tortoises uh, across the, you know, across the desert, uh, the broader desert, is uh, vehicle strikes. And, you know, it, it might not surprise all of you, but it might surprise some of you how many tortoises, um, you know, we get reported to us that are hit by vehicles each year. And, Unfortunately, many of those don't survive, but you know, occasionally some do. And um, I've built a pretty good partnership with a couple uh, veterinarians and with the Marine Corps in particular. And we've we've now rehabilitated probably between just in the last handful of years, 15 to 20 tortoises that were probably wouldn't have survived without some kind of an intervention. And um, you know, our goal there is to rehab them to the point where we can release them back into the wild. And that's a really really cool program that that I've been fortunate to be involved with. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And, give someone else some time. Thanks, Scott. And, I, and I'm, I'm going to come back to you um, after we hear from James and Vince. We actually have some questions about um, rehabbing tortoises. Great. I guess I'll, I'll go next. Um, Scott fairly covered everything that we do in our office fairly well. The only difference between Scott and my, my positions is that he works up in the Mojave Desert and I work down in the Colorado Desert, which includes most of Eastern, River, Eastern Riverside and Imperial County, um, where the range of the tortoise extends towards the south, towards Mexico. Um, part of our conservation efforts and a lot of the regulatory work that we do is we work with a, a number of federal agencies, such as Bureau of Land Management, um, National Park Service, U.S. Fish U.S. Forest Service, and through those regulatory processes, we develop conservation measures to try to figure out ways to um, decrease impacts to desert tortoises for, that um, may encounter from those projects. Um, specific projects are along the I-10 uh, corridor that I'm sure many of you have driven across and have seen all of these solar facilities going in. Well, a lot of that is desert tortoise habitat. And so we've worked with BLM, we've worked with developers to develop programs and measures in place to help reduce the impacts to desert tortoise. Um, some of that involves with translocation efforts. So the idea behind translocation is that when the solar facility goes in, they fence off the area, they clear the area for desert tortoises, and then they move these tortoises to a better area or to an identified area that we've, we've come up with with the Bureau of Land Management or whoever the federal agency is that we're working with. And that helps reduce the amount of impact as it's being displaced from its, its essential home range right there. So those are just some types of regulatory conservation efforts that the service gets involved with. It's just kind of figuring out how to reduce impacts to desert tortoise and other federally listed species for those projects. Um, and Scott mentioned public outreach. 
you know, I think, I think that's, that's kind of a, a core goal that I had envisioned when I joined the service about five years ago is, is that, you know, we need to make sure that we're being very transparent with the types of work that we're doing and the conservation efforts that we're doing. And on top of that, um, we actually do have a recovery plan for Desert Tortoise. It's actually available online if you want to search for Desert Tortoise Recovery, the Desert Tortoise Recovery Plan. You can actually read up on all of the specific threats, stressors, and recovery actions that our organization and others are working on to help um, to help improve populations of tortoises. And part of that includes public outreach, it includes habitat restoration, it includes land acquisition as well. Um, land acquisition is also an important part of conservation because a lot of private lands have great habitat for desert tortoise. And so when we are able to, in, uh, when we are able to work with private landowners to establish conservation on their lands, that also helps the species as well. So those were just a few other things that I kind of wanted to highlight that uh, to add to what Scott had mentioned. Yes, thank you for doing that, kind of opening our eyes to all of these different components that have to come together for successful conservation. Um, James, I'll let you explain a bit about what the Living Desert does and then um, and we have some really great audience questions to get to after that as well. Awesome. Well, I think uh, like Scott, Vince, and Kayla all said as well, you know, conservation is, is not something that one organization does, right? We all work together because conservation is a team sport, you know? If anyone says, oh, I And that uh, recovery plan that Vince mentioned has really been an important tool for all of us here and who we collaborate with for figuring out the best ways forward. So uh, we're, we're very happy and, and uh, honored to be a part of that uh, recovery plan um, and the planning for it and how to address the threats. So the things that we do here at the Living Desert really are trying to get at the threats to the tortoise, as with all of the things that all of us are doing. Um, we get at that in a couple different ways. One is, uh, as we were talking about at the outset, kind of education and outreach programs. And uh, rather than viewing uh, parts of the community that may be problematic, one could say, we view them as, as allies, maybe allies waiting to be made. Uh, so a lot, for example, of the threats that the tortoises are facing in our area here in the Coachella Valley come from food subsidies, food that's provided to ravens by uncovered trash. So we have a time to talk trash campaign <laughs> uh, that we work with and distribute across the whole range of the desert tortoise up through Arizona, uh, Utah, and um, Nevada as well with Fish and Wildlife Service, of course. Uh, we reach out to OHV communities, and I have another sticker that's harder for me to reach, but we work with OHV communities because they're important um, novel um, travelers into more pristine desert habitats. So if we could view and, and work with, with people who go off-road off a lot as allies so that they will help clean up travel safely and care for the desert while still, of course, enjoying this amazing place in which we live, uh, we're gonna be able to reduce the threats, the road collisions, the, the introductions of food into the habitat. So uh, ravens are a major motivator for a lot of our education and outreach programs. Um, some of you may have seen, and a couple of you I know were at, our drive-in event that we had last night, uh, where we, show, we showed a, a tortoise documentary and then also uh, the birds about a horde of blackbirds that descend on a community and eat it, which is not dissimilar from the tortoise's experience with ravens. Um, so uh, it's sort of a fun ways to engage with people and get them, as Vince was saying, passionate about conserving this species. So we work with a lot of people. We have a Gold Star restaurant program that's trying to get restaurants to cover their trash and close their dumpster lids because they are one of the main uncovered dumpster lids, or uncovered dumpsters are one of the main contributors of these food subsidies to ravens. So our education outreach is all geared towards behavior change so that people will want to conserve the species. 
Um, we also are involved in, as Kayla was talking about, uh, some habitat restoration projects. We grow lots of plants to restore some degraded areas of the desert. And many of these plants are, of course, food that are valuable for the tortoise. So this is trying to improve habitats for species so that the carrying capacity of tortoises in that area could go up so that their populations will increase. Um, so we have, we have several botanists on staff who are very passionate about growing and uh, outplanting these species. And then eventually, and we've done a little bit of this already in, in two different ways, uh, we are very much looking forward to being able to help increase the populations of tortoises directly through care of eggs that we get from wild populations and grow them and care foster them until they get large enough that ravens cannot eat them because raven predation is a major threat to tortoises as you likely have heard. Um, until they're about five or six years old in the wild, their shell can be cut through and consumed from the inside out. They're just eviscerated by the ravens. So by rearing animals in, in under human care, we can actually get these animals to be large enough and their shells thick enough and hard enough that ravens can't get through it in only two or three years, based on some recent data that, that a lot of our colleagues have been working on. So we have been doing some of that and we are looking forward to doing that more to be able to introduce these animals into areas with intact habitats or that we are already addressing the threats of the ravens or road collisions and whatnot, so that those populations can be augmented and then grow on their own. Because really, the best thing for all of us is when the desert tortoise becomes secure enough in its home range that it does not need to be listed. And all of us don't have to do the things that we do. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate goal for all conservation projects. To work ourselves out of a job. To work ourselves out of a job. Exactly, yeah. Alex. Exactly. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's no shortage of other jobs that we could get involved with. <laughs> yes, well, uh, thanks, James, for filling us in on the living desert work. Um, I'm going to move us forward to the audience questions. We have a few uh, that we can get to and, and remember to the audience as well that you can submit your questions uh, on Zoom through Q&A or also directly onto our Facebook Live, and we will attend to them. Um, so I have a few here, and I actually have one all the way from Scotland. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to get to that one just yet. So the first one, um, well, Scott, I know you mentioned uh, working with rehab earlier. This is a rehab question, but of course, all of you should feel uh, welcome to answer here. Um, this is the question. It seems well established that a desert tortoise cannot be released once someone removes it from the home habitat. So could we go into just a bit of detail on the science on this? And then there's a question, would we actually be able to rehab tortoises for release if we were able to invest more time and funds? Um, or is it possible that no matter what we invest, we can't get to that rehab? So kind of what's, what's the issue with, with rehabbing tortoises, getting them maybe from the wild and back out into the wild? Okay, so there's a, there's a couple, that question makes a couple of good points that I'll touch on. Um, I guess, when, when the person asks about tortoises after being removed from their, you know, home range, their home habitat, whether they can be placed back in the wild. Um, I think the, you know, one, one of the primary concerns um, that kind of drives, I think, you know, questions like this is uh, uh, various types of diseases that tortoises can transmit to each other and then within populations. Um, <clears throat> whenever a tortoise is brought into captivity, there's always that concern. Captive tortoises tend to carry uh, these, you know, different types of viruses, different types of pathogens more often than wild tortoises. And so when wild tortoises are brought in um, to a captive situation, a lot of times they're exposed to these captive bred animals that can carry these pathogens. And then the fear is that, you know, if placed back in the wild, then they're going to carry that pathogen back into the wild population. And so we have a very robust disease testing uh, protocol. Um, so when we're rehabbing tortoises, um, you know, um, you know, testing them for the diseases that we know about is a part of that, and we wouldn't release one that, that was infected. Um, <clears throat> we've, we've found, you know, if, you've, if you're familiar with the term translocation, that's, you know, taking an organism, an individual, out of its home range and, and moving it to a different location for whatever reason. It could be because of a solar project, it could be because of military training, etc. Um, you know, we've been collecting years and years of data on translocated tortoises, and we've found that they're really, really resilient animals. 
Um, they're, they, are, they are pretty capable of reestablishing themselves in a new uh, range, in a new uh, part of the desert when they're, when they're placed there. Um, so rehabbing is definitely um, a useful and effective tool um, as, as long as you can get the tortoise back you know, to a healthy state where it can fend for itself and fend off predators and dig burrows and find food and do those things. Sometimes when they're injured too badly, they, they're just not gonna heal to the point where they can do that. And so we, you know, we wouldn't put them back out in the wild. But um, you know, I have many examples of tortoises that you know, I mentioned before, otherwise wouldn't have survived, but after a couple years of intensive rehab work, um, they do just fine when we put them back out. So that's, that can be pretty successful when it's done more properly. Yeah, go ahead, Gene. Yeah, I'd like to, absolutely true, Scott. Um, you know, one of the things that I, that I didn't mention that we do that complements what Scott's doing too is that um, we're, a, we're sort of a halfway house at the Living Desert for pets that people can't keep because they're moving or because they're having other issues. Uh, we don't want pets to be released into the wild for certain for the exact same reasons that Scott was saying, that they often have an upper respiratory tract disease or one of some other things. And we don't want that to be introduced into the public, into the the wild populations, not the public. Um, and that is a, a, a real concern. So we, we have a halfway house for tortoises that are pets. And then we work with the California Turtle and Tortoise Clubs to be able to adopt them out to new houses. So if any of you are passionate about desert tortoises, we have some, some friends that you could make. But please don't release your, your pets back out into the wild because that is a real problem contact us. <laughs> and I'd like to add on to what James was discussing too. So when you're at, when you're out hiking or you're OHVing or you're out enjoying the desert, we often get calls where people will, you know, actually bring in tortoises because they're like, well, this, this little guy couldn't survive out there. And so they bring it into the living desert or we get a call from the public or they bring it to a biologist in Joshua Tree National Park. And we definitely do not encourage that type of action because these tortoises, like Scott mentioned, are very resilient. They are adapted um, to survive these extreme conditions out here in the desert. If you see a hurt tortoise, if you, by all means, feel free to reach out to your local conservation group or to the service or to the living desert and you know, just ask what, what you can do in response to the tortoise. Ideally, we would like to have a GPS point, if possible, and a photo. Those two, I, two items would be great to help us learn more about the range of tortoise, as well as what other potential threats might actually be out there and impacting these species as well. Great, thank you all for, for your thoughts on that one. Um, I, have an, I have another question here. Uh, Kayla, you might want to take a crack at this one or one of our biologists here. And I'm glad that this question came up. Uh, it's not a topic we've really talked about yet. Uh, the topic being climate change. So the question, as a species whose sex is determined by the temperature during the incubation period, what can be done to mitigate climate change impacts on sex ratios? Uh, you know, there's when they're out in the climate, there's not a lot we can do to control the out, the outdoor temperature. But I think, um, you know, having raising desert tortoises in captive environments and then releasing them in the wild once they've their shells ossified, something like that, if that's a temperature controlled model, uh, repair a possibly skewed sex ratio that could be occurring in the wild. Um, that's kind of what uh, Scott was talking about earlier with having those desert tortoises um, to to release later. So, and I'll you know jump in and say you know with tortoises when we think about you know tortoise reproduction you know the females dig a nest. Uh, sometimes the nest is inside a burrow. Sometimes the nest is outside of a burrow. Sometimes the nest is right at the mouth of a burrow. Um, nests can be at different depths within the soil. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of unknowns here. Um, I don't have a really good answer for how to mitigate climate change broadly, but, you know, there's a lot of questions around, 
you know, as a species and considering a tortoise's biology, are female tortoises going to figure this out? Are they going to start laying their eggs deeper in the burrow, deeper underground where the temperatures are cooler? Are they going to, you know, shift the time of year when they lay the eggs? Um, are they going to migrate their range north or up, you know, upwards in elevation to find cooler areas? These are all really good questions and I don't know that we have a lot of information out there now, but I guarantee you there are people working on that. <laughs> To, to follow up to, um, I think that we, we all do know how we can address this issue personally as well, because climate change is a real thing, and we all know things that we can all do to reduce our impact on worsening climate change that's, all right, that's going to happen. You know, drive less, you buy less, um, live more, but with fewer things. Um, you know, use green power, EVs, Transportation is a huge part of our footprint ecologically and the amount of, of carbon that we put out into the environment. So the less carbon we can emit, the better the planet is. So we can help tortoises by bicycling. How about that? Let's bicycle for tortoises <laughs> just to get to work and whatnot if it's possible. So there, there's a lot of things we all know. There's those, these kinds of stories are all over the public. But you know, in addition to working with the tortoises through uh, breeding them in, in, uh, under human care, expecting that the tortoise is being able to deal with the climate change themselves, which is a very good point. Um, we need to take action on climate change and this is our opportunity to do so. Definitely. And then I'll, I'll jump in and add a few things. So as wildlife biologists for the service, when we are looking at development projects or just projects in general, we do consider climate factors in our analysis. We consider precipitation, we define it as precipitation and temperature essentially. And we personally can't do any mitigative actions for those types of changes, but we can at least acknowledge and recognize the data that we have had to support what type of climates are being experienced in the area. And so with that, um, that's one way that the service kind of helps address and, and look at climate factors. The other thing James touched on is, you know, doing your part as the public, you can also make sure that you, you pick up your trash or you cover your trash and do those types of activities that help support well, high quality habitat for not only desert tortoise, but you know, for us as well, so that we can enjoy our pristine environmental, uh, the pristine environment. Thanks Vince for adding on to that. I'm going to um, share our question that came in all the way from Scotland uh, now. And if I could, if maybe just one of you could give us a quick answer for this and then um, just cause we're kind of getting to the end of our live panel today. And then after that one response, I have uh, one kind of en ending final question uh, for all of you. So the question uh, that came in through Facebook uh, from Graham is, do you think that the desert tortoise gets less publicity when we've had uh, slightly more visual or dangerous or legendary desert animals in the area? What do you guys think? <laughs> I'll take a stab. I, I think that Vince mentioned this earlier and I think this is a really good way to think about it. Uh, the desert tortoise is, is quite the charismatic species. Um, people in the Mojave Desert have been keeping them for pets for probably hundreds of years. Um, people love seeing them when they're out hiking or biking or camping or whatever. Um, they're almost instantly recognizable. Um, and I think that, yeah, they just, they, are actually, uh, you know, comparing them to other species and, you know, the species that get, you know, all the press and the attention. I actually think the desert tortoises are right at the top of that list. I think it's such a broad ranging species. I think turtles and tortoises across the world are some of the most threatened animals that there are. Um, and I think that, you know, the desert tortoise is just, um, you know, people, people really seem to respond when they see a desert tortoise. Definitely, and I think it says a lot that we have a whole week dedicated to celebrating the species as well. 
Alrighty, so we're gonna start wrapping up here. I have uh, one last question. I was hoping you could each add your thoughts here. Uh, in a way, we've we've touched on it in a in a few responses already. Uh, kind of the main purpose, or one of the main reasons that we're all here today, is to engage our wider community, right? To um, come together and learn about what we can all do to protect this beloved species, the desert tortoise. Um, so we've mentioned a few things that people can do already to help us conserve this species. Uh, for example, acting on climate, covering your trash. Uh, Kayla mentioned looking under your vehicle before you drive away from a natural area. So there are these, these things that we can do to help. Um, but I was wondering uh, if there are, if you would each uh, tell us a bit more about uh, what's, what's an action that you would recommend to a community member who's wanting to support tortoise conservation? And if you feel like we've checked that box already, um, I know there's some other things that we could mention, but um, I, I oh. think it would also be helpful to talk about kind of what, what hope do you have in tortoise conservation or what, what gives you hope that we can continue to protect this species um, in attempt to kind of prevent further decline? I'll, uh, I'll go first. So, <clears throat> you know, this whole week has shown that there is a lot of folks who work with this species and who care about this species. And even though we are going through a pandemic right now, we are still capable of pursuing conservation efforts. And everybody can do their part to help promote conservation in general, you know? Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, picking up your trash or covering your trash um, while you're hiking, even pack it in, pack it out. Um, if you're hiking on a trail and you see trash, pick it up as well. Those are little actions that can really help help improve the quality of habitat for all desert species. You know, we, we talked about how desert tortoise is a charismatic species. It's also kind of an umbrella species too, because all the protections that we provide to desert tortoise extends to all of the, the plants that grow out here, all the beautiful wildflowers that come out, um, and just a number of different species involved. And so the hope that I have is that we continue doing this on a regular basis and that next year we can you know, have in-person events where we can pull weeds or we can go hiking and have discussions with the public and interact with people. But in the meantime, it's very helpful to see how many people have involved with, the, with this effort, even though we are going through a very stressful and tough time this year. <laughs> Scott, go ahead. I was, I, was, I was calling on you or Kayla, so you read my mind even though I was muted. Okay, so I'll, I'll throw it quickly in addition to what Vince said. Um, you know, I think that, you know, as, as a member of the public, we, we can all educate our friends, our family, our neighbors about some of the things we've talked about, about climate change, about conserving habitat and protecting habitat for any species and how important that really is. Habitat loss and habitat Fragmentation, habitat, you know, just um, deterioration um, is probably one of the leading threats for most of the species that, that our, our collective organizations work to conserve and protect and uh, recover. Um, I think that supporting organizations that do that kind of work, such as the Living Desert, they do amazing work over there. Um, there are other organizations in the desert, uh, I'll name a few, uh, Mojave Desert Land Trust, Transitions Habitat Conservancy. In my mind, there, there are two of the organizations that are just doing tremendous work for the desert tortoise. Um, they acquire habitat, they restore it, and they protect it in perpetuity. And, and, and that way it, it's left in place and it's left intact for the species that depend on it. So I'd say education and supporting the types of organizations that are doing that kind of work are really critical. Definitely. Um, Kayla, what other thoughts do you have on what, what the community members can do or, or what gives us hope to keep protecting the species? You know, I, I do think education is a, a big part of spreading awareness about desert tortoise. I always, you know, when I'm out talking to the public and people find out I'm a wildlife biologist, they always ask, you know, what species do you work with? And so I tell them about desert tortoise and they're like, oh, you know, I, I didn't know about tortoise or 
So I try to tell them, you know, that, that species is out there and current threats and things they can do and or where they could go and see a tortoise, you know, we've got all the, the desert that they can go and explore and maybe see a tortoise in its natural habitat. Um, and I think that gets people really excited that they didn't know that these animals are right at their back door, maybe. Um, and something that gives me hope is working with different partners, like um, the field restoration crew is when they were out um, this spring, they saw a desert tortoise and they got really excited about seeing it, you know, because that's the species that they're doing all this work for. So they were really happy to see it at a safe distance. And um, I think, you know, they kind of saw that that's the species they're working to conserve. Fantastic. Thank you. So yeah, I, I think everything has pretty well been said already. Um, thank you three for being so thorough. Um, you know, the things that, that, that we can do really benefit this species. And, you know, Graham, contrary to what you were saying about the more charismatic desert species, I think anybody who gets to see a tortoise really knows and feels a connection to it. They are just so darn adorable. Not just the babies, but even the adults. They're, they're an amazing species and people who see them love them. And that's, you know, also part of the problem, right? People want to take them home, want to care for them, like Vince was saying. So I think to add to the things that we've been talking about and to reiterate, you know, cover your trash, recreate responsibly. I got the sticker. Uh, recreate responsibly and clean up after yourself. Go out and enjoy the deserts that we live in and appreciate the animals. But like Kayla was just saying, appreciate them from a distance. These animals are adapted to this ecosystem. So I, I actually have great hope for the tortoise because they are such an amazingly charismatic species. And I think the more people are aware of how great they are and the important roles that they play in creating habitats for other species through the conservation, also the digging of their burrows that makes it possible for like burrowing owls and many other species to have homes. Um, I think we will win the public over. We need advocates and everybody who's watching this, you're now an advocate. Your job is to go and talk to people and tell our story. Tell the stories that we've been telling here. That's the future. Thanks. Indeed. Well, I think we're just at the end of our scheduled time for today. So on behalf of the Living Desert, thank you, Kayla, Scott, Vince, and, and Dr. James for joining us today and helping us learn about the desert tortoise and what we can do to protect this species. Uh, thanks also to the audience for tuning in, uh, for sharing this, this moment with us, and for giving us your questions. Uh, we really appreciate that. So if you have more questions, please feel free to comment on that Facebook uh, link with the live video, and, and we will get to them and follow up with you. Otherwise, we hope to see you at the Living Desert, of course, and then also hope to see you out there enjoying our native desert, hiking on trails, seeing wildlife, enjoying wildlife. Uh, so thank you for joining us today. <laughs>